Back to ICOCA. Um, so very warm welcome to Christoph uh, Galvin. He's the head of communications and outreach. Christoph, you may have seen on, on uh, Twitter that I looked up your actual job title on LinkedIn earlier <laughs> today. Um, it's fantastic that you're here. I already told my class that you're um, in a, having a very busy week because it's the general assembly or general annual meeting. Uh, of ICOCA this week, and um, there are multiple events. I think some of them are also public, but you will tell us more. Um, and uh, we've just discussed the uh, general concept of MSIs and are excited to now hear from a representative of a real MSIs about the advantages and challenges and what you do in this very specific industry. Um, I'll hand it over to you. Um, Rim has made you co-host, uh, so you can share your screen and your slides. Let me actually close mine to not, there we go. And so here you are. We can now also better see you. Hello, Christopher. Hi there. Christopher is based in Geneva, but difficult times with COVID. He also has two children like I do. Those children are, if I may say, I hope it's okay, Christopher. That's They're in right. team. So just to uh, be on the safe side, we're doing this online. Next time, I hope we pick up the class. <laughs> so Christopher, welcome and over to you. Well, thank you so much, Dorothea. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Perfect, yes. Great, Very and you can see my screen. Yes. Great. Well, look, thank you so much for uh, this invitation. Yes, it is our annual General Assembly this week, uh, which goes on all week. There are uh, plenary sessions, there's one on uh, tomorrow and one on Friday that are open to the public. I actually one of my slides has uh, one of those highlighted. So I do encourage, if you do have time to attend those, please do so. Right. So today, um, what I wanted to do is first give you a little kind of historical background uh, that, to, to, to give you the context of what resulted in ICOCA. Um, and then I'm going to explain what ICOCA is and what we do. And then really look specifically at the International Code of Conduct itself to try and draw out how we do our human rights due diligence on our member companies and what some of the challenges in doing that are. So one of the questions that Dorothea kind of posed to me uh, before this was, was why is Switzerland involved? And so we are based here in Geneva, so I can't be actually in the classroom. Switzerland has been a, uh, a, a strong supporter from the get-go of ICOCA, um, as well as the Montreux document, and I'll come on to that. Um, and I think that's really because they're a natural extension of Switzerland's humanitarian tradition uh, and its peace-building efforts. And they're enshrined, of course, in the Geneva Conventions. They're a prior priority for, for Swiss foreign policy and uh, a really a central component of, of international Geneva. Coincidentally, um, and perhaps ironically, uh, Switzerland also has a long tradition of mercenaries um, from the late Middle Ages through to the Renaissance. Uh, and what you see here are the, the last uh, unit uh, permitted by the Swiss government of, of mercenaries, and that's the Vatican Swiss Guard. Um, what is also enshrined in Swiss law actually is that any Swiss private security company operating overseas now has to be a member of, of ICOCA. So if we come up to the modern day, uh, this is a photo of Eric Prince, who was the founder and CEO of a company called Blackwater. Uh, they are or were a private military and security company that were contracted by the US government to provide security services in Iraq. And as you'll see, he's a very respectable looking guy. He's uh, very eloquent. Uh, he's made a lot of money out of his companies. Uh, he's from a very privileged background. In fact, he's the brother of former US Secretary of Education under Donald Trump, Betsy DeVos. Um, and these are his employees or were his employees. Um, so this is a photograph of uh, Blackwater personnel active in operations in Iraq. This photo is from 20, 2004. Um, and this is really the kind of image that a lot of people think of when they think of private security companies. You'll notice that uh, the, uh, the, these people, and it's the guy in the t-shirt with the gun who we're looking at, he's a Blackwater employee, but they're side by side with American servicemen. Um, in 2007, Blackwater employees shot uh, at Iraqi civilians, killing 17 and injuring a further 20 in Nisar Square in Baghdad. 
Uh, that was while they were escorting a, a US government convoy. And it was really events such as the Nissan Square disaster, as well as a, a number of other incidents involving private military and security companies that were the impetus for governments, for civil society, and for the industry itself actually to come together uh, to think about how to better regulate the industry so that these kinds of human rights violations and abuses weren't occurring. But keep this image in mind because this was almost 20 years ago and the industry and the issues have really evolved a lot since then. But one of the first outcomes of, uh, of, of the discussions that took place was the formulation of the Montreux document. Um, so this is the first international document that really reaffirms international legal obligations of states regarding activities of private military and security companies. It also contains a series of best practices that are designed to help states take appropriate measures to comply with their obligations under international law. And it's really a reflection of the consensus that international law is also applicable to private military and security companies and that they don't operate in a, in a legal, legal background, um, vacuum. It was the result of an initiative launched by Switzerland, again, along with the I ICRC in early 2006, um, and was, was formulated and signed in, in 2008. Now, the International Code of Conduct uh, came just a couple of years later and was drafted in a multi-stakeholder conference um, concluded in September 2010, that was again facilitated by the Swiss government, as well as a couple of other organizations uh, based here in Geneva. Um, the conference involved, as it was multi-stakeholder, private military security companies, uh, industry associations, uh, the governments, of course, and not just uh, Switzerland, but also UK and US, as well as civil society and non-governmental organizations. And originally there were 58 uh, signatories to the code, which grew to over 700. We actually do not any longer as an association recognize signatory status. Um, and, and the reason why is that we have no way of verifying and monitoring whether uh, those companies that signed the code are actually complying with what they said they would do. And in fact, today is a, a or this week is a, is a, is a very important week because at this year's AGA, uh, we have on the table for the membership to vote as to whether to strike off uh, signatory status from the code and replace that with uh, members and affiliates of the association. Um, but note that the, the code of conduct itself, uh, it came out of a negotiation. It's a negotiated document. And as Dorothea said earlier, negotiation invariably involves compromise. And so, when we get on to consider some of the details uh, of the code later, um, think about what is missing in it and, and why that might be. The, the focus of, of the code as well, I should just say, is on complex environments. And, and that term is contested, but at the time, uh, the, the kind of assumption and, and uh, the, the description was that, that we were really talking about conflict and post-conflict states. So the following year, well, since the code was signed, uh, the UN guiding principles were endorsed uh, by the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, I should have put the source here. So this comes from a WBCSD uh, CEO guide uh, on human rights, uh, which I recommend if you haven't, I've probably already looked at it through the course, but it's a, it's a, it's a good tool. Um, the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights looks at ICOCA as a sector specific implementation of the UNGPs and actually as a case that other industries could potentially learn from. So in terms of the kind of implementation of, of the respect and, and remedy pillars that businesses must follow, well, this is applicable to both private security companies themselves who are our members uh, and importantly, their clients. Um, and ICOCA really uses this model uh, in its own work and in its interactions with both its members and affiliate companies uh, and their clients. So what, what are we and who are we? Well, you know, I'm here today because we are a multi-stakeholder initiative. Um, and, and to better understand, you know, how we work, well, let's look at who we are. So our membership is made up currently of seven governments. Um, now, as you'll see, these are all Northern Western, I should say, developed countries. 
so that's US, UK, Switzerland, Sweden, Norway, Australia, and Canada. That number has not grown. Um, and, you know, frankly, that is a, uh, if, if we're talking about MSIs, that is a, a particular weakness, perhaps, of ICOCA at the moment that we have not been able to as yet grow the, the, the government membership. Um, the reasons for that are not clear, um, but probably relate to the legacy of the organization and the fact that uh, this came out of Afghan, Afghanistan and Iraq wars, um, perhaps was seen as a, uh, you know, an Anglo-Saxon kind of initiative, um, but also, uh, you know, because our focus is on complex environments, while we are very interested in engaging and, and really uh, advocating for more develop, developing countries to, to step up and join, um, those countries are understandably don't necessarily want to be labeled as complex. And so uh, growing that government membership pillar is a challenge. Uh, we have currently about 42 civil society organizations uh, from 18 different countries involved in the association. Uh, these range from large international uh, big known organizations like Human Rights Watch um, to very small local civil society organizations working on the ground. Um, one of the challenges with this issue, with, with the security issue, is that for civil society organizations, and Dorothea has also already touched on this, who are you know, often resource poor, uh, they're often looking for funding. Um, this is security and, and certainly private security is not really an issue that say the foundation world is particularly interested in. Um, and so there are very, very few, uh, if any, civil society organizations at a very local level who are exclusively focused on, on private security, um, but, but they're an incredibly important pillar that we work with, uh, and I'll come on to some of the reasons why later. So our membership uh, pillar is made up of around about 100 companies. Uh, they're headquartered in 41 countries and, and providing security services in, in 80 different areas. And while the legacy, as I mentioned, of the organization uh, was uh, you know, perhaps US, UK companies were increasingly seeing interest and growth coming from national regional based private security companies locally owned uh, in the developing world. We have about 55 observers to the association. Uh, these range from large multinational clients of private security companies. So, you know, some of the big extractive industries uh to certification bodies who have a particular interest in what we're doing um down to uh not down to but also including a, a kind of interested academics one critique of multi-stakeholder initiatives is that uh they don't involve rights holders at the governance table and so you know we don't have community organizations where private security companies are operating directly involved other than through our CSO membership. But as I mentioned previously, uh, it's very hard to find CSOs who are exclusively working on this issue. And so um, engaging with rights holders, uh, and we'll come on to another group, perhaps the most important group in some ways of rights holders uh, a bit later, and that is the private security personnel themselves. They are somewhat represented through, uh, you know, the corporate pillar, but of course, the corporate pillar representation is, is largely through executive management, uh, not really the security guards on the gate. So what do we do? Well, uh, I'm going to go through each of our core functions that you can see listed here. Um, there's a logic order to this. It's not actually putting in the, in the order of, of how I'm going to go through. But if you look down from top to bottom, um, I've listed these in what I think is really perhaps uh, what multi-stakeholders and certainly what we do most well and most effectively, down to perhaps the most challenging uh, aspects of, of our work. So firstly, if we look at capacity building, uh, I think this is you know, possibly where multi-stakeholder initiatives really have a measurable impact. And we're seeing this now in the online training that we're providing for, for our member and affiliate companies. We provide guidance documentation for companies on, on different aspects of the code. Uh, so for example, this year we released a, a guidance on uh, human rights impact assessment. We've also produced a guidance on preventing sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, but the detailed guidance documents 
are, are really not necessarily effective training materials, especially if you consider the, the guards on the gates. So this year we've launched an online uh, training course on the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, uh, which is really designed to be more accessible in many ways and, and more interactive. Of course, there are still many challenges of accessibility, uh, not least, of course, connectivity, um, but also language, literacy, uh, and other things. But the materials here in the, in the training course can be used by companies directly in the classroom. And so at the moment, we've got about a thousand people. So these are security personnel who've taken the online training on preventing sexual exploitation and abuse. Uh, we're translating it into four more languages, and we hope really to see these figures grow over time. In fact, um, increasingly, uh, our member companies are now making this course compulsory uh, for all of their employees. So the second area I want to look at is um, the certification. And Dorothy, I've just noticed that my battery is going, so I'm going to plug this in. There we go. Um, so Dorothy touched on, on certification and we do run a certification scheme. And this is a, a, an area where we are seeing uptake and, and hopefully there's some impact. We have our own uh, ICOCA certification, which is linked to a number of international standards. And I'm sure you're familiar with, with the ISOs. We only accept certification on these standards from a select number of certification bodies who we actually assess. And one of the issues with certification and one of the reasons why we do this is that certificate, certificates to standards can really easily be bought on any street corner around the world from un unscrupulous certification bodies who really don't do rigorous audits. Um, and so all certifications are not equal. Um, the certification is you know, a really complex topic and we could spend several classes on this. I'm, I'm happy kind of take questions uh, at the end. Um, but, you know, I, I, I put this as one of the success stories because uh, more and more of our companies are becoming certified. Yeah. You'll see from this graph, uh, it shows the ratio of ICOCA certified member companies in gray and how this has changed over time uh, since the, the, the scheme was launched. Um, the, the actually the, the certified companies are in orange, sorry. And so, you know, obviously at 2016, when the scheme was launched, it was a very small proportion, but up to now, 2021, that orange uh, bar has, has increased and it's now the largest proportion of our, of our membership. You will notice that there is a, a light gray bar that was introduced in 2020. This was a new category of company that we uh, bought online. And so these are called affiliates. Um, when affiliates join, they are not, uh, they're not mandatorily on a, on a certification uh, path as our members. And so the reason for this was to try and have a more inclusive open net um, because the certification world is, is really can be a bottleneck for many companies, especially companies um, operating in the complex environments where we're talking about who are owned locally, nationally. The whole world of international standards is a different lexicon. They don't necessarily have uh, things in place to become certified, but we hope that this will be a step and a path ultimately to certification. These are just, uh, you know, the logos of our certified companies. Um, you may recognize some of these names. Control risk is a big one. Um, G4S risk management, I should say, is one small component of G4S. G4S is essentially a franchise company. Um, and so this is just one small, small company within them. The, the next area of our work is on uh, monitoring and, um, you know, monitoring, I would say, is a bigger challenge. Uh, and why is that? Well, uh, Dorothy has also already mentioned that many multi-stakeholder initiatives, including our own, have a kind of a skeleton staff. So we are less than 10 people based here in Geneva. Um, so how are we, uh, you know, being such a small team supposed to monitor the operations of private security companies, companies operating in challenging environments all over the world. Well, uh, we have different ways that we try and do this. And one way is through mandatory self-reporting. So companies have to submit uh, an annual self-assessment to us on an annual, uh, annual basis, of course. Um, we, we work with them tracking their development over time um, to make sure that they are in compliance. We do do country visits. Of course, the pandemic uh, has really put a stop to those or we were able to get back on the road 
uh, last month and, and do that first visit after 18 months to South Sudan. And of course, we monitor on a daily basis news about our, our member companies and affiliate companies. But the, the CSO network that I mentioned before is really critical uh, because they, they can act as eyes and ears on the ground. Uh, they are best placed, best positioned to know what the issues are in their countries. And so they act as a kind of conduit to, to feed information to us. I say pro probably the most challenging area for, for certainly us and, and I'm sure other multi-stakeholder organizations is, is, the, um, is the complaints function. Um, raising awareness about the association is, is a major hurdle uh, and essentially takes resources. Uh, but there are things like language barriers, which of course present a major obstacle um, to getting the word out to rights holders, to communities where private security companies are operating. And even if rights holders do know about the association, uh, Dorothy's already mentioned the word trust. It's so important on this issue. Uh, you know, do rights holders have the confidence to report incidents to us without fear of reprisals? And rights holders, by the way, importantly include the personnel of private security companies themselves. One of the criteria for companies to join the association is that they must have uh, a, a clearly accessible grievance mechanism themselves. So these core functions, you know, they don't work uh, in silos. We kind of have an integrated approach, so each kind of supports the other. Um, and in this way, uh, you know, we hope that, that, that what we're doing is, is ultimately slowly but surely raising standards, certainly across our, our member companies. So if we've got time, I'd like to look at uh, the code itself to kind of draw out some of the, the ways that we do this human rights due diligence and some of the challenges, of course, that, that we have. Now, the code is essentially split into two main sections. The first uh, regarding the, the conduct of personnel themselves. So this is the security guards on the gate. Um, and the second is really aimed at commitments uh, regarding the management and governance of companies. So the senior executives of the companies are, and their boards. If we look at the guards on the gate, um, there are essentially 10 principles that you'll see here. Um, the first three are distinct from the next six because these are principles where there may be uh, reason for, for use. Uh, the following six are prohibited in all circumstances. So if we look at the first principle, the use of force, um, the code does provide some detail on each of these principles, but it doesn't really go into operational detail of what companies should do. And so, as, a, as an organization, we've developed specific indicators for each of the principles to both provide guidance to companies on how they should be implementing the code and to help us assess how well they're complying with these principles. So if we look at the use of force, uh, for example, some of the things that we look at are uh, that the member companies got an adopted written rules for the use of force, and this should include that uh, restriction of the use of force to only when necessary, restriction of the use of force to only where it's proportionate to the threat, restriction to the use of force only where appropriate to the situation, et cetera, et cetera. What we uh, want to see from companies is that they're doing initial and recurrent training on the rules of the use of force to all personnel uh, that are providing, you know, at the coal face providing security services. We want to see that use of force cards are being handed out to all personnel, uh, whether they are armed or unarmed. And we want to see that the rules of the use of force are being agreed with, with the clients. So the indicators we're looking at are the, are the personnel carrying cards? Uh, are there, is the company monitoring on a regular basis that the personnel operate in accordance with the rules? Um, and you know, are they recording incidents? Uh, where, where the use of force has been used. The next two principles, again, are principles where there could be reason for, for a company and personnel to, to, to use these. They're related. So if we look at uh, apprehension of persons, um, the indicators that we've developed here is that, uh, you know, apprehending persons should only, it's restricted to only cases where there's an imminent threat of violence against company personnel or others, 
uh, or if there's an attack or crime against company personnel, clients, or property under their protection. I'm, for the interest of time, I'm not going to go into you know, more detail on each of these um, in case people do have questions at the end. Uh, but if we just go through them you know, one by one, uh, we have the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, which I've mentioned uh, previously. Uh, human trafficking is, of course, prohibited. And uh, I will say that human trafficking is a major issue, uh, as well as prohibition of slavery or forced labor. This is a major issue in the private security sector, especially uh, regarding uh, personnel working in the Middle East who are being sourced from uh, third countries, including in Asia and East Africa. Um, and we know that bonded labor is, is a major issue here. Uh, prohibition, prohibition on the worst forms of, of child labor, and uh, discrimination. So if we quickly look at uh, section G, um, these are the, the kind of commitments laid out, uh, focused on the management commitments uh, of the company. And just with the principles concerning the conduct of personnel themselves, um, ICOC has developed indicators. But I'd like to consider a couple of these and talk a bit about the challenges both for the companies themselves in complying with these commitments, as well as for us as a multi-stakeholder initiative in, in verifying and doing our due diligence on companies to make sure that they're really doing as they say that they are doing. So first, if we wanna see that the code principles and commitments are integrated into company policy and compliance, this is relatively simple, of course, uh, it's based on documentation that the company should be able to provide us for, for analysis. But let's look at the selection and vetting of personnel. So you'll see here some of the, some of the kind of uh, commitments that, that, that we look for, uh, but, but some of the challenges for companies are things that you may not you know, immediately think of. Um, for example, in many countries, police and criminal records aren't available. In many countries, uh, names and dates of birth are, of people are, are not available, or names may be spelt in multiple different ways. And so, you know, accessing a record is, is not necessarily easy, and it may not exist. Uh, there are a lack of resources to, to really conduct uh, due diligence by companies themselves. And fraud can be a major problem. So people use fake IDs, they make false claims of, of their experience and, and qualifications. In some countries, there are data protection laws. Uh, so, you know, they may be forbidden from providing referees. Uh, and and in, in other contexts, companies may not actually be freely able to choose who they hire. Mm -hmm. Some of the challenges for, for us as a multi-stakeholder initiative in trying to verify all this is that, uh, well, you've already seen we're, we're a very small secretariat. Uh, it's impossible for us, of course, to verify all criminal and background records of personnel. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. Um, sometimes when there is documentation, uh, it's not in a, an operating language of ICOCA, and so that's a challenge. Um, companies may have rigorous procedures on paper, uh, but, you know, we need to make sure that these are, are, are implemented in practice. So it's not easy uh, doing due diligence. Um, I'm not sure how much time we've got, Dorothy. It's half past one. Um, I, can, I can keep going. Uh, how much time do you have? I absolutely love this, Chris, because you're landing our plane. You know, I often said the unguiding principles and the requirement of uh, human rights due diligence is floating at 10,000 feet. And so how do we make this real? And all the examples that you just referred to are just so practical and real for companies. Like, what do you do when you're supposed to hire personnel, check birth certificates, but then in some countries there are no birth certificates available. And so these are the real challenges of real companies. So I absolutely love it. So if you have a couple more of these examples, please go ahead. But I do want to leave at least eight minutes, you know, to, to for the class to also ask questions. What, what time do we go till? So 45 max. Okay, okay. So I can I can rush through this. Oh, five okay. minutes, maybe. Yeah. Okay, great. So um so let's look at let's look at one potentially two more of these governance issues. So if we look at the the training of, of personnel themselves, 
We want to make sure that company procedures detail initial, initial and recurrent training to personnel. Uh, we want to look at the nature of the training. We want to look at the training program, the methodology, and the frequency of it. And we want to see that prior to starting the, the duties that company personnel uh, that, that, that are performing uh, kind of cold face security services are, are receiving appropriate induction training. We want to see that it's regular because regular training is the most effective. But the challenges for companies are that often their training it focuses on kind of operational aspects rather than addressing company personnel human rights responsibilities. This is not you know the lexicon of private security companies. There are often very low levels of education among personnel, and this can make training to international standards and international law very, very difficult to understand. Uh, so, you know, there's a requirement to make it simple. Uh, but there are practicalities, you know, when you think about weapons, uh, are firing ranges accessible to, to companies or not? The challenges for us in verifying these kinds of things are, again, looking at forgery, uh, you know, training records can be forged. Um, and while there's a, a kind of a need to enforce uniform standards, especially when it comes to human rights, uh, all, the training has to be kind of context specific and it has to take into account local laws and customs. Um, so there's really a need to kind of translate the broad principles of the code into clear, engaging and, and appropriate for the context uh, kind of content for, for personnel. Mm. Finally, um, if we look at grievance procedures, um, you know, we want to make sure that a company must have a grievance procedure to be a member of the association. We want to make sure that that grievance procedure is, is clearly accessible. Uh, and we want to see that it's clearly communicated. But challenges for companies are that grievance is really complex. Uh, again, we could spend one or two classes on this. It's a very complicated subject. Um, it is costly to implement. It requires dedicated personnel with specialized competencies on human rights. And that's really often lacking with security companies and, and many other kind of corporate entities. Um, while grievance procedures might be in place, they may not be effectively com communicated. Um, so, you know, that can be hard to verify. Uh, and other challenges is that, you know, again, for us, there's just a lack of industry knowledge on the topic. Um, if they do have a, a grievance procedure, uh, it, it's one of the reasons why it's hard to implement is because often personnel will take grievances through the line of, of you know, human resource line. They'll go to their manager rather than to the grievance procedure, to the grievance mechanism. Um, now, a company may say that there, there have been no grievances. Uh, that may be the case, but are there, uh, is that because people don't trust the, the, the grievance mechanism? Uh, and you know that those things are again very very hard to, to to verify so you know on each of these principles uh obviously there's not time today to go through the kind of indicators we've we've set out but but we have indicators on each companies have challenges we as an organization have challenges uh but it is a learning uh journey uh for for all involved we're, we're still a young organization what else do we do? Well, we provide kind of thought leadership on, on the topics of the day. Uh, you know, we are a convening organization as well as a multi-stakeholder initiative. And so I think a really important aspect of, of, of MSIs is that they are able to convene, uh, you know, people from who, who don't normally talk to each other and get them around the table uh, and have civil dialogue um, to try and find compromise, to try and find space uh, to, to kind of raise standards. I asked you at the beginning when we looked at the uh, photo of those Blackwater personnel to keep that photo in mind. Um, as I mentioned, that was taken 20 years ago. Uh, back then, private security was really considered the domain of Western ex-military personnel. It was a very high profit margin business. It was niche business with, with very little competition. People were making a lot of money. But if we fast forward 20 years, uh, today estimates put the industry at around 20 million employees worldwide. Uh, that does not include non-formal sector. So you know, many, many security companies are not formally registered in their country of origin. Um, so that number is probably a lot higher. 
Walmart is actually the largest company in the world by employee, but did you know that the second largest is a US company called Allied Universal, who acquired earlier this year uh, a, a more infamous private security company, or I've mentioned G4S. Uh, so Allied Universal now has 800,000 employees. In many countries, private security guards work 12 hour shifts, sometimes back to back, six, seven days a week. And that is an industry standard. In South Sudan, where we've just been, guards typically earn uh, $2 a day. And in many countries, they earn less than a living wage. It's highly competitive with companies underbidding each other to win contracts and clients basing their contracting decisions on cost alone. So when we think of human rights abuses, probably the biggest issue today concerns the treatment of private security personnel themselves. And this issue is not discussed. It's not raised in the media. Uh, it is, you know, we are doing our best to try and raise this issue. I do encourage all of you uh, tomorrow, if you can join this plenary panel, panel where we'll be discussing this very issue, uh, please do sign up. So, you know, finally, I just want to conclude by saying that, uh, Responsible security uh, really can contribute to the sustainable development goals in a number of different areas. Uh, we've actually worked with one of our observers to kind of map how the International Code of Conduct does contribute to the sustainable development goals. Uh, you'll see on the right here, there's another uh, MSI initiative called the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights. They look at both public and private security. And so this mapping looks at how these initiatives potentially contribute to, to the SDGs. Um, we have a strategic plan uh, that's available on our website. I'm not gonna go through each of these goals in detail, leave time for questions, uh, but thank you. Christopher, thank you, this was fantastic. Um, since you have so much on your plate, can I just ask bluntly, um, are you ever interested in interns? Yes, always. And one of the, you know, real uh, advantages, if you say, of an MSI and a, and a skeleton office in a secretariat is that interns have an oversized impact on the organization. So we are always looking for interns. Uh, you know, we are not, you're not a cog in the wheel. Uh, you'll get involved in the day-to-day -day running of, of the organization. That sounds like an invitation for applications to me. So. It is. Okay, thank you so much. Um, questions from you, any reactions? I have one immediate reaction while you think about yours. So one advantage of MSIs that we haven't brought up yet is that if companies talk about themselves and how well they are doing in terms of human rights, it's just not very credible because if you talk about yourself, you could say anything. But how many of the ICOCA companies are actually using the seal of approval um, of ICOCA to prove to their government and to their other stakeholders that they are conducting their business in line with uh, human rights? And I think particularly in a context like the UK with the Modern Slavery Act requiring um, this, you know, it might be particularly important. Like, how, it's it's more than just boosting your reputation. It gives a seal of approval and uh, a, a verified um, approval to to what you do beyond just doing your own human rights report, for example. So there's a couple of things I'll I'll, I'll say um, <laughs> in terms of governments themselves, yeah. because a lot of these big security contracts. Um, can can be with with governments, diplomatic service, etc. Yeah. Um, now, historically, even some of our member governments, um, you know, have not necessarily walked the talk, and mm -hmm. so you know, when it comes to contracting on the ground, and there can yeah. be a disconnect between you know what capital is saying has to happen and, and yeah. the reality of what happens on the ground in country. And so, you know, there may be a policy in place, and this isn't just for governments, this is for all organizations. Yeah. Uh, there may be a, you know, a, a headquarters policy, but is the reality in the field really reflecting that? And that doesn't always happen. Um, the other issue with governments is that we, uh, typically our membership uh, on our board, you know, th these are the departments of uh, foreign affairs, uh, Department of State, uh, UK, FCDO, yeah. Um, but they are one government entity, but, you know, if you look at uh, UK aid, US aid, 
Uh, there are huge other contracting government organizations uh, who are uh, using private security services yeah. and, and are not in line with, with you know, the, the, the foreign ministry's policy. Yes. And that is a real challenge because mm -hmm. at a capital level, uh, there, there may be no one file holder with, with government. We've never come across a situation where there's one file holder across government departments for this issue. So right. that, that is a challenge. Um, I will say that, you know, this does not just and absolutely does not just uh, relate to governments. Um, in my role, the majority of my focus in terms of outreach is not with private security companies themselves, because we know what drives companies to us is when clients are requiring Requesting, yeah. membership in their tenders. Um, and that does not happen anything like as much as it should do. Uh, for, for whatever reason, private security is really not at the moment seen as a supply chain issue. It's okay. not a product, it's a service. I think that's one of the issues. Yeah. It's dispersed, it's not central. You mentioned Bangladesh before, yeah. you know, of course there have been terror incidents in factories, but with private security, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, and so until something bad happens and, and bad things do happen, I'll give you an example of Carrefour, uh, the French yeah. supermarket chain, uh, there were riots across Brazil in November against Carrefour. The share price went down because uh, somebody was shot, uh, killed by security, private security personnel outside the supermarket. The CEO stepped in uh, and did, you know, a PR kind of campaign on it. But it's only really when those things happen that, that clients start to think about these issues. And it's a real, real major challenge getting clients to, uh, to, to think about this. And I'm really pleased to hear that you're going to be talking about the investor community uh, in your next class because we think that is a key leverage point on clients. We are working with a number of investor community organizations on trying to raise this issue with investors because they have financial stake at risk if bad things happen. If Carpool's share price goes down, it's the investors in Carpool who, who are hurt. And as tragic as these incidences are, they make the case for hopefully many other companies to step up. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, that the, 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 a real problem with, with MSIs is that when it's working well, there is no story to tell. <laughs> you, yeah, you work yourself out of business, but I don't think we're anywhere close. <laughs> so, no. <it's> just... <laughs> All right. Any reactions or questions from you? Yes, um, I'll repeat the question because you won't be able to hear her, I'm afraid. So, yeah. Okay, so her question is, what is the role of the observers in ICOCA? Because some were in countries that are not members of the ICOCA. Yeah, m m many are not. Um, and as I mentioned, the observer group is a real diverse group ranging from large multinationals who are clients of private security to interested academics and, and, and everything in between. And so their role depends on, on who they are and what they do. Um, we are working, for example, we've had a long project now over the last two years with an observer called the Global Interagency Security Forum. They are a network of humanitarian organizations, humanitarian security managers. Um, we've just come out with a report on, on security contracting in the humanitarian sector. So this is focused on humanitarians as clients. Um, and I'll tell you from our research, uh, the findings are that uh, humanitarian organizations are really falling short in their duty of care to all stakeholders, including beneficiary co um, communities, but also their own staff and the, the, the staff of security personnel that they're contracting. So that's an example you know, of, a, of, a, of an ongoing project with a, with an observer that we've got, but but it depends on who they are. I know that for academics, there was a request on your behalf to actually look into the um, connection between poor working conditions of guards and you know the number of incidences and how, how whether there's a, a correlation. Uh, I can well imagine that, and it's something I'd love to investigate. So, yeah, I mean, I will say in terms of the academic community, and we're, we're hoping to involve you uh, in this, is that there is a real dearth of data 
on this sector. And I think, again, that's because it's dispersed. It's kind of out of sight, out of mind. There's been no focus on it. So there is no, we have no handle on right. much of the figures, even in terms of just how many people work in the sector, but, but especially on incidents. Right. And so there is huge opportunity here, I think, to engage. And I think there's increasing uh, appetite from the academic community to start looking at this issue because as I've mentioned, you know, the sector is now huge. In many countries, private security personnel outnumber police by a factor of, for example, South Africa, it's five to one. Um, and so, huge. Yeah, you know, yeah. th there is a real need to put more focus on this. And I think the academic yeah. community has a real role to play. Oh, okay, I hear you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. I think we have to wrap this up. Um, and I know one question that my students will have after classes, maybe have your slides, um, your slides, Chris. Could you sure. share those slides um, with yeah. us? That would yeah. be I'll just great. have to add some of the sources for the photos and things. I I don't, to do that. don't worry, they go on a password protected website. So it's not that they go okay. out of the world. I don't want you to have additional work, but this was absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm also very happy we recorded the session. The recording also doesn't go anywhere, but let's talk about maybe there's some interest from your side to use this as sort of an introduction to a yeah, yeah. um, session um, for other things as well, because that was super. Um, Chris, thanks so much. I hope to meet you in person at some time in the near future after yes. all in the same place. Yes, um, I do too. And let me briefly turn around the camera so that you can to say goodbye to the room. Yeah. I've not done this before, but you can see how the room looks like and say goodbye. Hi. Thanks for coming. I'm sorry I can't be there, but please do um, yeah, check out our internship opportunities and I really do encourage you to, uh, to apply. And, uh, All right. Super. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris, again. Bye-bye. I will sign up tomorrow. Thank you all. See you next week. Stay safe. Wear the mask. Thank you. Bye bye, Daniel.